What's going on guys? Welcome to part 5 of Hackintosh from start to finish. I hope you guys are enjoying the series. Lots of work is going into it, so I'm hoping you guys are getting a lot from it. So if you watched the last video in this series, part 4, you can watch it by clicking here if you haven't. If you have watched it, then you should know, or have if you've been following it like physically, you should have a working installation of Mac OS X Lite on your PC hardware. But now that it's installed, maybe you want to do some things to it, such as get the most from your processor by overclocking, maybe you want to add dual displays as you can see behind me here, or maybe your app store and or or iCloud is simply is not working for you. These are fairly common things that users want out of their system, whether you want to overclock or whether you need to fix your app store needs and wants are different, but uh, they'll all be addressed in this video, so there are a few things you're going to need. So first up, let's talk about dual displays. Obviously, you will need two displays. As you can see behind me, I have two 24-inch ASUS displays. However, you're also going to need a graphics card that can support it. Now, if you watched part two of my series where we were picking out our hardware, you would know that I recommend AMD cards. Currently, I'm rocking an AMD Radeon HD 6850, and it works great with dual displays. I have been trying to get a third display, but that's a little trickier for stuff I'll get into in just a second. But you have to have, like I said, you have to have a card that can support dual displays. Depending on the card, it could mean two DVIs. Depending on the card, it could mean one DVI and one HDMI depending on the card it could mean a DVI and a display port so once again you really have to do your research when you're picking out your hardware before you buy that graphics card make sure that if you want dual displays that it can support it if you want three displays make sure it can support three displays and as explained in part three this is due to frame buffers not all frame buffers work perfectly in OS 10 for example the one I'm using right now I can't have three monitors at least right now because of frame buffers. I can't use, I have my card right now has two DVIs, it has one on top and one on bottom. I can't use the one on bottom. If I plug something into it, it simply doesn't work. And this is not a fault of the graphics card, it's just a fault of the frame buffers that talk to OS X and tell the card how many ports it has. And the reason it doesn't quite line up is because this card wasn't meant to work with a Mac. This card was meant to go on a PC, not a Mac, so there's no, like, I guess, drivers for it. But thanks to Chimera, we can get it working. You also need to know that some graphics cards require specific cables. Like I said at the beginning, this could be uh, DVI, this could be an HDMI. But also, if you go with a 3 monitor display, chances are you're going to need to have at least one active adapter. And that doesn't just pass the signal on, it actually converts it to a different type of signal, which is required for iFinity. So for iFinity, say for example, I have... Uh, HDMI, a DVI, and a DisplayPort. The DisplayPort is probably going to have to be an active adapter, and those are a lot more expensive, about $30, where you can get a regular cable for about 4 or 5 Moving on to the iCloud and the App Store fix, this is a very simple fix. I've done a video on it previously, but I'll discuss it in this video just to have all the information in one place. But in order to fix the iCloud problem, you're going to need a program called Chameleon Wizard. You can download that right from the description, check that out, and I'll be doing a tutorial up here in just a few minutes once I'm done talking here. And the last thing I'm going to be talking about in this video is overclocking. So overclocking is taking your processor, say that's 3 gigahertz, and you're making it run at 3.5 or 4 gigahertz. Now that's cool and everything. Who doesn't want a faster processor? But there's two sides to every story. There's obviously some cons here. So the first one is that it's faster than the manufacturer intended it. So basically what that means is this is sort of at your own risk. If this shortens the life of your CPU, then you know you have no one to blame but yourself. The second con I have here is that it's going to put out more heat. Now this is going to mean a couple things. Number one, your system will probably run louder because your fans are going to be spinning faster to actually blow all that hot air off the processor. But number two, you're also going to have to increase your voltages. Now this is all done from your system's BIOS. You can up your voltage, you can up your base clock and your multiplier. And I'm going to give you guys sort of a brief overclocking tutorial on this. But I don't recommend this unless you're one of those people that want to get the most out of your hardware. Me included. This is a 2.8 gigahertz Core i7. I have it running very stable at 3.5 gigahertz, so that's an extra 0.7 gigahertz, and trust me, it definitely boosts my system performance. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to a screen capture, and let's get started with the tutorials. So the first thing I want to look at here are frame buffers, and like I said earlier, this is what basically makes OS X recognize how many ports are on your graphics card. So if you've got an OS X up and running, and you think you have all the right kecks, but maybe some of your ports just don't work, you don't really know why, then frame buffers is probably an issue. Now I first off want to say that this is only for AMD or ATI cards, NVIDIA doesn't use uh, these different frame buffers, so don't even worry about it. If you have an NVIDIA card, then you're on your own, because I haven't used an NVIDIA card for a long time. And the one I used wasn't a lot of what you guys are going to be using today, like GTX cards. So I don't know much about those, but that's for the Tony Mac form if you want to ask there. But this is going to be regarding AMD cards. So if you think you have a frame buffer issue on your hands and you want to change it, you have to look for a text document. And that can be found here by going to your, the root of the installation hard drive. If you don't know how to do that, simply make sure Finder is your selected application and go to Preferences by hitting Command, Comma. 
and that'll bring up your finder preferences and make sure hard disk is shown on the desktop from there you can just drag this right in to the side panel here I've already done that as you can see so it's going to be located in extra and it's right here this org.chameleon.boot.plist now if we quick look at this you can see it's just a text document with some codes that's fine make sure when you open it that it's set to open with text edit so I'm going to go ahead and open this here and you can see we have a whole bunch of stuff here now my card as long as you have Chimera Chimera does all the magic here it just defaults to do, uh, duckweed which if you don't know what duckweed is there's a whole list of frame buffers right here that's annoying me <laughs> okay so here we have a full list of frame buffers and the way you would input these is you can either do it in Chimera which I'll show you guys in just a second and the benefit of using Chimera is that you don't have to open any of this up so I'll show you that in just a second but if you use Chimera to find one that does work for you you'd use the same format this key followed by string followed by key followed by string you can see a pattern here and you can really put it anywhere just don't put it first or last I recommend uh, just somewhere right in the middle I recommend above graphics enabler so like I said follow the same format we're gonna input key if I could type things right and now you wanna put ATI config and it has to look just like that with a capital A and a capital C after that you wanna put the end of the string line or the, sorry the end of the key line now you simply want to return tab in do the same thing but string and once you have string in you can research on different cards with these frame buffers but say for example you found that fan work worked for your card you'd simply copy fan work just like it is throw it here and then do the end of the string line and that's how you would change your frame buffer from there you just save it and then you reboot and it will default to that frame buffer. So if you can't find anything on the Tony Mac forums or anywhere else on the internet that details whether the card you picked works with these or not, then you can simply just trial and error these. And I'll show you guys how to do that right now. Alright, so here we are at the bootloader. I'm going to go ahead and hit a key to interrupt the auto boot. Now with Macintosh SSD or whatever you call it, your Mac OS X installation drive, and you simply just start typing. As you can see, that little boot menu comes so up. So this is how you test the frame buffer before you actually add it to your boot.p list. Now this is very efficient because if it doesn't work, if you just load a frame buffer and it's actually like worse than the last one or just no improvement, then it actually didn't make any changes to your system. This is just a temporary one-time boot with this command. So you actually don't change anything. So once you find one here that does work, then you can add that to your boot.p list. So how you enter these is ATI config the same way with the capital A and the capital C. Now after ATI config, you want to put equals, and then the name of that frame buffer. So uh, my system uses duckweed, it's just the default using Chimera, so I'll go ahead and type that because I know it'll work. So hopefully you guys can see that, and now I'm going to hit enter. Alright, and here's my system booting. As you can see, I'm going to freehand this. I have both monitors. So it's really not that hard to manually enter these, and it can save you a lot of time. Next up are some common problems involving the Mac App Store and iCloud. A lot of people have the issue where once they install Lion, they'll go to fire up the App Store or to log into iCloud, and it's going to tell you that your computer couldn't be verified or that your password is incorrect when you know that it's not. So this is a pretty simple way to fix that, but first we're going to address the whole iCloud scenario. So you need a program for this called Chameleon Wizard. There's a link in the description. Go ahead and download that. So let's just open it up here. Now once it's open, you want to come up to the SM BIOS menu here, and you want to click Edit. Now as you can see, I've already given my system the Mac Pro 5.1 system definition. As you can see, if I go to More Info, it says Mac Pro Mid-2010. This can be done right for Multibeast. It's pretty easy to do. I recommend doing that, by the way, if you have hardware like mine. But so what we're going to be doing here is generating a serial number. This is how iCloud verifies that you're running a Mac. So model number, I'm going to keep that the same. Manufacturing location, I'm going to keep that the same. You're a manufacturer, it doesn't really matter. It still says that it's a mid-2010 up in my settings. But we can manufacture, just generate a random number and a random number. And so as you can see, that actually changes your serial number over here. So once you do that, click Save. You're going to want to reboot, and after that, you should be able to log into iCloud with no problems. Now, if it doesn't work, simply repeat the process. Another thing you could try to do is just try a pre-made SM BIOS. Come up to Mac Pro 5.1. 
it'll generate one for you. Simply save it by clicking this and reboot. So just keep doing this until it works. It's really not a hard process, but it can go a long way. Now moving on to the App Store, this is much easier of a fix. All it involves is navigating to a directory. It's Macintosh SSD, or in your case, whatever your boot volume is called. From there, you want to go to Library, then Preferences, then System Configuration, and you're going to find a file called NetworkInterfaces.plist. You can scroll through it, it'll look something like this. All you want to do is simply delete it. You're going to have to put in your password. And from there, just empty your recycle bin and reboot your machine. Now it'll actually rebuild that file automatically upon boot up. So next time you boot up there'll be a new file there and you can try logging into the App Store and it should work for you. And the last thing I'm going to show you guys today is how to overclock your CPU. Now in order to do this you're going to have to access your BIOS. Like I said this is not done through OS 10 or through Windows. This is done straight from the BIOS. So to access your BIOS when your system is booting up you want to hit whatever key. For example on my motherboard it happens to be the delete key and that will give me, I believe it will say setup and that will get you into your BIOS. So once you're here you want to go to this MB motherboard intelligent tweaker MIT hit enter. Now what you want to do is go to frequency settings and the first thing you want to do come down here is enable your base clock control. Uh, by default this will be disabled so just enable it and that will actually allow you to change not only your base clock but also your multiplier up here as well. So for example, I'll put this down to say 18. Now this is how your processor frequency is calculated. It'd be 18 times your base clock. So 18 times 175 is 3.15 gigahertz. That'd be 3,150 if you're doing it you know, math-wise. But that translates to 3.15 gigahertz. So if I wanted to say up this to 180, then it would be 18 times 180, which is 3.24 gigahertz. So I'm going to go back to what I had which was 175 and a multiplier of 20 and that gets me to my uh, 3.5 gigahertz now also when you do this your RAM speed is going to change as well as you can see there by default this motherboard recognizes my RAM as uh, 1066 megahertz this is 1333 megahertz RAM but as you can see I am slightly overclocking it with my system memory multiplier by default yours might be 10 so if I were to leave that at 10 then I'm really overclocking my memory and honestly overclocking memory really doesn't get you much performance so it's not really worth it to run your RAM that much faster than what it was intended to it's not like the CPU where it can make a huge difference so I would just stick to this as close to the actual factory settings as you can go so 1333 megahertz RAM at 1400 really isn't that bad but now this isn't it since you're requiring more power from your CPU you're also going to need to give it some more voltage so this is highly dependent on your motherboard. As you can see, here are my settings right here. And the first thing you want to do, this normal right here, the CPU V core, that'll probably be set to auto. If it is, then you can't tweak your dynamic uh, V core. So you have to make that normal. And then you're free to actually tweak this guy. Now don't put it too high or too low. I mean, when you're doing this, I, I highly recommend you just do it one at a time. Reboot and try it. One at a time, reboot and try it one at a time, reboot and try it. Because if you go too high or too low, this could potentially damage your CPU and like shorten the life of it or maybe even just have it not work at all. As you can see that big red warning on the right side, you know, it's, it's a pretty serious thing. So you have to be very careful when doing this. Now keep in mind when you're doing this, the more voltage equals more heat. So in order to keep your temperatures low and still have a stable overclock, you really have to find that middle ground where it's not too high and it's not too low. If you go either too high or too low on your voltages, you're going to see kernel panics, you're going to see freezes, and once again, it's just not that good for your CPU. So you really have to find that middle ground. For my specific motherboard and my specific CPU, and at the given speeds that you guys have seen, the 3.5 gigahertz, with that base clock and that multiplier, I found that 0 .00625 volts really does the trick. So overclocking is something that you really just have to mess around with because it's probably different for every system. So before exiting out of the BIOS here, you just want to go to your memory settings. And once again, here's a way that you can tweak your memory multiplier. Mine's already set to go at 8. You've probably already tweaked yours in the other menu, but just in case, here's another way to look at it. Now this performance enhance here, I just have mine set to turbo. Extreme I wouldn't recommend, standard I wouldn't recommend. Turbo, I believe, is just you know a nice middle ground. It'll get you some nice performance. Now, if you really know what you're doing, you're free to change some more stuff, but personally, I just leave everything else set to auto. I figure the computer knows what to do more than I do, but the only thing I changed here was the CPU vCore and the dynamic vCore. Other than that, I would just leave everything alone. And that was just a quick guide on overclocking. Once you have all your settings just the way you want them, simply exit your BIOS. As you can see on my motherboard, down at the bottom there, F10 is saved, so if I were to hit F10 and hit enter, then it reboots with these settings. 
So there you guys have it. There's just a few optimizations for your Hackintosh. Those are the most common things people want to get working. A lot of times people restoring their iCloud doesn't work or they want to get dual displays up and running. Uh, especially overclocking. I've had a lot of people ask me how to overclock. So there you guys go. Sort of a brief tutorial. Just be careful when you do all these things. Make sure you just go take it slow and just make sure you know what you're doing. So I don't want to drag this video out any longer than it has to be. So thank you guys very much for watching. I'm at CPUKid on Twitter. I really hope you guys got something out of this video. Uh, this was part five. I have two more parts lined up like set in stone right here. But like I said over time this series might just expand. I've created the playlist on my channel page just for this series. So this definitely has some room for expansion in the future when future OS's come out like 10.7.3 or maybe even beyond that. Be sure to stick around for part 6. That's going to be all about Windows running parallels or dual booting with Windows just in case you have to run those few Windows apps. So like I said, be sure to stick around for that in just a few days and thanks for watching.